Welcome everyone to the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment webinar series. My name is Matt Balhoff. I'm the director of the center and a professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at UT Austin. To learn more about the center, please visit our website. Also join our LinkedIn page and subscribe to our YouTube channels where you can see many of our past webinars. So a little bit about us. We are uh, a group of faculty and principal investigators at UT Austin. There's 26 of us. We do a variety of different research in the center, a number of different subsurface applications, technical disciplines, and use a number of engineering tools. We collaborate with industry a lot of different ways. One of those is with our industrial affiliate programs. I've listed a few here. I've highlighted carbon utilization, storage, and transportation because it is our newest IAP and is also very relevant to today's uh, webinar discussion. Before moving on to the webinar, I wanted to make an announcement that uh, we have recently announced our 2022 Schechter Award winner. Uh, the center is honoring the late Bob Schechter for his lifetime commitment to higher education and research by establishing a research award in his name. Uh, Bob was the intellectual soul of both the petroleum and chemical engineering departments at UT Austin and is considered by uh, many to be one of the great professors of our lifetime. He was a professor at UT for more than 30 years. Uh, our previous honoree was Lynn Orr of Stanford a few years ago, and this year's awardee is Dr. Steve Bryant, who's now at the University of Calgary, but was at UT Austin for a very long time. His seminar, it's, it's, it's going to be a live seminar, not a webinar. It'll be this coming Monday, May 16th at 3 p.m. in the EER Mobile Auditorium on UT's campus. It is open to the public, and I hope you can all make it in person. Um, if not, uh, we do plan to post the uh, recording on uh, on the YouTube channel. There won't be a live stream, but there will be a recording posted later. So uh, Steve's talk is is very interesting and, and timely. It's on decarbonizing energy systems on time, the case for optimism. So uh, again, I encourage you to all attend next Monday in person. But uh, back to our webinars. Um, our webinars are informative industry driven webinars by researchers and collaborators in the center. Uh, they are hosted on the second Tuesday of each month at noon via Teams. Um, and afterwards, we we do post the uh, recording on YouTube in case you missed it. But we do encourage you to attend live so that you can ask questions and 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 be involved in any discussion. Uh, upcoming webinars next month is uh, Dr. Mary Wheeler. Um, and um, her talk is to be to be determined. Uh, but today's talk is, of course, uh, by uh, Larry Lake, who's going to talk about CO2 EUR to CCS, the maturation and migration of technology. So uh, I don't think that uh, Larry needs much of an introduction, but um, he is a professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering and a member of CSEE. He holds the Sh Shahid and Sharon Ula chair. He has bachelor's and PhD degrees in chemical engineering from Arizona State and Rice University, respectively. Um, he is the co-author of more than 100 technical papers um, and has served on the board of directors of SPE and, and have won numerous awards uh, from SPE and, and elsewhere. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Larry Lake so that he can give his webinar. Well, thanks, Matt. Uh, good introduction, and uh, thank everybody for showing up today at uh, at this talk. It uh, <clears throat> it's an interesting talk. It uh, kind of came about uh, as one approaches the end of uh, one's uh, career here, and that uh, does uh, uh, does periodic evaluations of where you stand and what you've done, and uh, that in part is uh, responsible for this uh, for this uh, uh, this presentation. Uh, just to make sure I don't forget folks, there are several people that I borrowed material from, and you've already heard Matt to say something about Steve Bryant, who's going to be our Schechter Award nominee or recipient next uh, uh, next Monday. And I do hope you can you can make it for that. 
uh, and uh, these folks I probably or may not credit them at the appropriate point in the uh, presentation. So that's I do it here at front at up front just to make sure that uh, I don't forget to do it at all. And uh, just kind of a setup, a few setup slides here, some that I think you've probably seen before. This slide is entitled CO2 increasing in the atmosphere and what it is showing is a well traveled plot of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. That is the, uh, uh, let's see, that's the, the red curve here that's pointing over here to the left. And on top of it, and this is from uh, one of Mohan Kjelker's presentation, is the average temperature. And I've seen these plots separately before, but I've never seen them plotted on top of each other. And you can see the websites if you want to see more detail about each one. I look at this plot and I remind myself that there's oftentimes a difference between cause reality and correlation, but we will uh, let it go. And it does seem that that CO2 is largely produced by burning fossil fuels. And boy, we are just beginning to realize how deeply in, ingrained that practice is in our, our society. And the CO2 has been building up in the atmosphere since the start of the quote, first industrial revolution, one IR. And then one thing that I think is important to uh, uh, to state, but is often often uh, not mentioned, is that uh, the amount of CO2 re released will increase with the standard of living. And to support that, let me uh, show you my favorite slide. Uh, this is comes from the CIA World Factbook, and it is for each data point. Uh, you can see is a different country. A couple of the countries, a few of the countries are called out there. On the ver vertical axis, it's a productivity, which is the uh, gross domestic per capita gross domestic product. And on the horizontal axis is consumption, which is the uh, hydrocarbon consumption per capita. Both axes are uh, per capita. So uh, uh, there, there should not be a relationship necessarily just on the basis of that, but you can see there is. I, I should point out that both axes are, uh, are log scales. So even the figure that shows a good deal of scatter, there's, there's even more scatter than it looks like there because of the logarithmic nature of it. But the point here is, is that there, you know, correlation and causality notwithstanding, there is a relationship between consumption and, uh, and, and, and uh, productivity. <clears throat> and you can see not only see individual uh, countries called out, I have no idea what they're doing at Gibraltar to be over here at this point, but I do have kind of an idea about uh, Qatar to be up here on the uh, gross domestic product. Uh, not only can you see some countries uh, uh, called out, but you can also see certain regions called out with the uh, uh, the shading of the points. Uh, uh, these points have been here tend to be in North America and Europe, and these points down in here tend to be with uh, Africa and Brunei uh, and, and uh, countries like that. But the deal is, is that we're looking forward into the future and we'd like to figure out some way to reduce the hydrocarbon consumption without at the same time reducing the productivity. In other words, I would like to break the trend here. And uh, that is kind of what we're uh, uh, what we're all about at, at, in, at UT and in, in various other places. Another way of looking forward is that if we do believe the trend is there and countries like China and especially India, India, if they're going to move up to the to the consumption or productivity level of the European countries, they're going to have to do a lot more consumption. And of course, the world is talking about loss, a lot less consumption. Um, these days, so we'll have to see how we can break the connection here. CO2 sources, this is a cartoon that shows the different uh, sources and uh, I just point over here the list of it, uh, coal power plant, coal power plants, especially coal fire ones, uh, uh, three to eight percent of the effluent is CO2, cement plants, 30 percent is, uh, is CO2, methane, steam methane reforming is about the same, ethanol plants generate a lot of CO2 and the other things as you see there. Uh, I should appreciate if somebody had the better numbers than, than what's seen here. I should appreciate being corrected via an email. And I didn't put a number on for planes, trains, and buses because I figured it can't be any more than 19% uh, because that's the 
uh, that's the concentration of oxygen in uh, in the atmosphere. <clears throat> of course, one of the summaries is to do global storage of CO2. And here's a slide from Sylvia Levisco that shows uh, where the, the ongoing storing sites all that you see there predominantly in Europe and North America. And that matches up pretty well with the previous slide because most of the consumption was in Europe and North America. So uh, maybe this is a favorable sign. Asia and Pacific uh, are growing and that the Middle East, Africa, Central South America are not uh, doing much of it at all. And that seems the most storage seems to be the most uh, the most uh, likely source of reducing CO2 in the atmosphere, at least holding steady. So spot the differences. I uh, got this slide from Steve Bryant. On the left is CCS carbon capture and storage. It doesn't generate revenue. On the right is carbon dioxide of war, and if we do it right, it does generate revenue. And in fact, it's a profit driven uh, enterprise, and we'll come back to that at the very end of the talk. Uh, it involves multi-phase flow, and so does CCEOR. It, uh, CCUS, particularly if it's most, uh, most, one of its most likely storage areas is, uh, is aquifers, and there's no proven trap. Now, it may be that we'll learn more about aquifers and we'll realize that there, there is a trap, but uh, uh, there's no proven trap, but in CCEOR, because there is a hydrocarbon accumulation, there is a field demonstrated strap, uh, uh, trap, so score one for CO2 EOR. CCS has injection wells. CCO2 EOR has injection and production wells. Sometimes production wells are called extractors. And I should say there are versions of CCS that, uh, that propose using uh, production wells, but that's not uh, uh, norm normally the main idea right now. Uh, <clears throat> speaking as a reservoir engineer, CCS without production wells tends to be toward a semi-steady state operation. That means where the uh, external boundaries are, are sealed and uh, there's no flow across it, but CO, CO2 EOR, because there, there are sources, tends to move in the long run to what a petroleum engineer would call semi-steady state or quasi-steady state operation. And that, that's that's an interesting dichotomy there because much of what we know about fluid displacements is based on a, a steady state flow. And uh, uh, they, many of those things maybe should be reevaluated as we move more towards semi-steady state flow. In CCS, C is captured and injected, and CCO2 EOR captured, it's captured and injected. Well, a lot of it is separation and reinjection. And then the CO2 is purchased over here, may be true in CCS. And in the United States, or I guess around the world, there's a lot of naturally occurring CO2. <coughs> it's a new slide to me, and I, I didn't realize that there was a lot of naturally occurring CO2 outside of the United States. But here's the one, the slide that I usually use that shows the CO2 sources that's in the, the, the blue dots in the United States. And it shows them sourcing the uh, the oil, oil production in in the Permian Basin and on the Gulf Coast over here, and it is certainly true that most of the uh, CO2 used in CO2 EOR is coming from natural sources. Uh, anyhow, uh, 2.8 out of 3 3.5 uh, uh, BCF, but the future is also on this map because you see all these dots here. Are showing CO2 from uh, from from human or anthropogenic sources, and it may be that we will see a shift of CO2 EOR from the blue dots to the uh, to the uh, uh, squares as as we go forward. Here's a simpler plot that goes from uh, Mississippi and Louisiana from the source in Jackson Dome uh, down through here to all of these uh, smaller reservoirs in South Louisiana and then down south of Houston. Uh, also, also naturally, uh, naturally source. Well, the idea is has some similarities to CO2 EOR. This cartoon is uh, versus this cartoon basically show up in every presentation. So CO2 injected or uh, purchased is injected into the reservoir. The idea being is to uh, 
and sometimes injected with water. The idea being is to displace all of this toward a production well where it is produced and then some of it is separated and recycled. But unfortunately, a lot of it is uh, uh, moved and just go goes out to the atmosphere. We're kind of late in coming to this, and so oftentimes people talk about the combination of CO2, EOR plus CCS as CCUS to utilization being using CO2 in some sort of a use useful or revenue generating manner. And the prime candidate for doing this is, is right on the screen in front of you. So some properties about CO2. <clears throat> Uh, what you see that colorful diagram on the left, probably needlessly colorful diagram on the left, is a pressure temperature diagram for uh, carbon dioxide. It's some unique characteristics. I'm sure everybody is familiar with the high triple point pressure of CO2, such that it's possible for CO2 to go from a gas to a solid without an intervening liquid phase. Temperature across the horizontal axis, pressure on the vertical axis. This area would be liquid CO2, this would be solid, and this would be gas. Solid CO2 is sometimes referred to as dry house. But the main point of the slide is to point out this bluish area up in here where CO2 is above the critical temperature and pressure. And to say to you that most applications of CO2 EOR fall in this region here, so that while most of us are tend to think of CO2 as a gas, it uh, it really and truly is a super crit critical fluid in the subsurface. And that is manifest in other ways. So on the left over here is a plot of CO2 density versus pressure. With several lines here corresponding to constant temperature. On the right over here is CO2 viscosity versus pressure with several lines corresponding to constant temperature. And what I've done here, see, see oh, this is Steve Bryant's idea, is I'm superposed these, these equations here on the curves, the red lines here, which shows how the, uh, in the left hand side, the density of CO2 changes over a range of pressures that correspond to a geothermal pressure, that's this, and geothermal temperature. Excuse me, let me get this pointer here, which is this one over here. And it's interesting enough that over the range of application, the density of CO2 is about 0.7 grams per cc, not too much different than the liquid density or liquid oil density, but the CO2 viscosity over here is about 0 0.06, and both of them are pretty constant. <clears throat> so the manifestation of a supercritical CO2 is something that has the density of a liquid and viscosity of a gas. And if you want to know what it is without looking up in tables, the density is about 0.7 grams per centimeter cube, and the viscosity is about 0 0.06 uh, centipoise. It kind of makes it an interesting, uh, interesting mix between gas and liquid, and I, I sort of like to call it solvent flooding. I don't like to call it gas flooding. Um, but because it's not really a gas, it's super critical is what is best. So let's talk about a 50 year experience with wells. And, and I think this slide might be a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit uh, out, of, out of order, but um, <clears throat> 50 years experience, this is in CO2 EOR, is that operating wells for decades is practical. There are no major problems and it is certainly true that there has to be some special treatment to maintain injectivity and things like that. Uh, but uh, all of these things seem to be uh, uh, able to be uh, accounted for with normal operations or some specially well-known operations in, in the field. So operating wells for decades is practical. CO2, EOR, the majority of it is predicated by the notion, the notion of miscibility, which is the fact that uh, two components will mix together without forming an interface. And a very common way of estimating miscibility between a crude oil and CO2, or any solvent for that matter, is something called a slim tube experiment. The physical nature of it is summarized over here on the left side. It's basically uh, 
what can I say? It's a slim tube. It's only a centimeter or so thick, and it's a meter or more, tens of meters long, uh, packed with glass beads, and it has extremely high permeability. And the standard experiment is shown here. <clears throat> that shows oil recovery. This is a, <clears throat> a given, a given a crude oil versus the pressure of multiple displacements in the experiment. And what we will see is the curve that's defined like this and the place at which the displacement is uh, levels out is called minimum disability pressure. And it's a rough idea, uh, particularly as it roughly use correlations. It's a rough idea of what the pressure you have to be at to, uh, uh, to attain disability. And disability means no capital pressure and a complete oil recovery in the areas that are touched. <clears throat> Many correlations are available, but we know basically disability is determined by pressure. The higher it is, the better. It's determined by intermediate content in the crude oil. The higher it is, the better. It's determined by temperature. The lower it is, the better. And it's determined by solvent type. And CO2 is a very good solvent. It's not the very best one, but it definitely is right in the big range there. So those four things do it. And there probably are tens or more of uh, correlations out there that express that quantitatively. Now, with that as a background, I want to move to a publication that uh, myself, my student, uh, Mohammed Latfalahi and Steve did uh, three years ago. I said, first, four years now. It's funny that paper's been out for uh, uh, a long time, but we're just beginning to get traction of it in the oil producing community. So this is 50 years from field observations, uh, lessons for CO2 storage from CO2 enhanced storage recovery. <clears throat> and I am very much indebted to Mohammed Latfalahi for, for carrying out the, ana the analysis of this. And as is true with most research projects, he, he gives more, it, 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 it raises more questions than it is answers. But let's uh, think about it. Let's talk about it. So on the left hand side here is a plot of oil rate versus time for the, I think it's the slaughter of state unit in, uh, in West Texas. And it's showing in blue here um, the oil rate, and it's showing in yellow here, which is uh, the gas oil ratio. That's on the, on the right hand side over here. And <clears throat> I don't know whether it's a coincidence or not, but I started in the oil business in 1973, about at this point right here where the rate went up, and I know it had nothing to do with it, but one hopes. Here's some lessons. First of all, the rates are very small. <clears throat> this was actually a pilot, one of the, the, one of the best pilots conducted and reported on in the literature. We're pretty mature right now, so I don't think there are very many, many pilots going on. The second thing, CO2 injected in 1977, but the truth is, well, 1977, uh, and I'll say that, that's a long time. So CO2 EOR is a mature technology. You have a lot of experience operating large-scale injection facilities for, uh, for C CCS. There's part of me that actually cringes a little bit when I hear myself say it's a mature technology, because I can certainly remember times in our industry when it was definitely not a mature technology. And so it's interesting how fast things grow. It, uh, the idea here was, believe it or not, in this period of time, there was, there was a feeling that you could not easily flood a, a reservoir that had been water flooded. And so the operator, it was Amico at the time, decided to do a water flood. And they did it right here, a classic water flood response. Rapid increase in rate, a collapse in the gas oil ratio right here. Usually it's this area in here that this accounts for the pressure maintenance part of the water flood and this area here that accounts for the actual displacement part. Uh, but it is interesting to see that you do get, uh, you can actually uh, get water flood uh, do CO2 for in a water flood reservoir because here in 1977, when they injected CO2, they began to see a rise over here in the oil rate, which is collectively known as a bank. Tip of the water flood response, I already said that. And 
came from an oil recovery at the time that was the shaded blue area is uh, about 25% of the visual in place, which turned out a little bit on the high side as compared to the numbers that we'll see a little bit later on, but uh, there's a couple of pretty good reasons for that right now. The gas oil ratio begins to increase at the beginning of CO2 injection. <clears throat> that is going to be said. What we're going to say on that is uh, do not do not expect, even if there is a CO2 bank, do not expect a clean oil bank because the CO2 and the oil for the most part are, are produced together. This is a WAG process, and one can actually see the WAG cycles up here in the gas oil ratio in this. And <clears throat> the very surprising thing to me, and I'm very late in coming to this, it is is the CO2 and oil are produced together. In fact, you might even convince yourself that the CO2 is produced a little bit ahead of the oil. That is to say that the productions are not usually displacements, but they are drags. Here's another one. This is a, a bit at the opposite end of the scale from, um, from the uh, Slaughter State Unit. This is the Wasson uh, Unit, Denver Unit. And you can see that it's a much bigger case because oil rates are huge. This is in thousands of barrels per day, hundreds of thousands of barrels right there. That's incre incredible. But here is the CO2 injection right here. And it is definitely true this was a success because we know, as we know, it's the difference between what happened and what would have happened. These dotted lines over here, that is the increment oil recovery. But it, uh, is CO2 uh, production without a bank. You do not have to have a bank for there to be a successful flood. And one of the learnings for that is that CO2 will flow through them through and past the native grind. If they're, if they're displaying CO2, the oil as a bank, it would be a, uh, it, it would be a clean oil production. Now <clears throat> let's go let's go now to the, uh, uh, the the main part of that paper that. Uh, that we wrote. This is a plot, and I'm indebted to Mike Stell and Ryder Scott for this data, that shows increment oil recovery as a percentage of original oil in place versus in injected CO2 as a percent of hydrocarbon hormone. I know you can't read this axis. I'm, I'm kind of glad that you do because uh, you would probably begin to see some really odd behavior right there, right there. But <clears throat> the one of the point is, is to is point out to you that there is a substantial variability in performance. Oil response is very quick. In the majority of cases, the oil starts being produced at about 5% of the pore volume of injected. Several large pore volume injected, this will come, come again uh, quite a bit in, in later slides, and if you can see the axis up here, I would say that there's a mix of carbonates and sandstone reservoirs. So that will say something about uh, uh, lithology. Ultimate recovery is 7 to 25%, and the average right over here is about 11%. Right there. So I'm going to do a little calculation here based upon sleep efficiency. And, and bear with me, those of you that have been around me know that I've gotten enamored with very simplified uh, techniques. One of the things we know for sure that sleep efficiency, and I'm pointing to the upper right plot here, uh, of course increases with time, but it also <clears throat> decreases with increasing mobility ratio, uh, which is this. And we know that CO2 will have a mobility ratio somewhere around 20. 20 to 10 meters, something like that. So the mobility ratio effect would be uh, an issue. You can see the cartoon on the left-hand side that shows what volumetric sweep is. And then the cartoon down at the bottom is to attempt to, attempt to draw attention to the effect of heterogeneity. As, as discussed, in, uh, discussed by Dr. Carson coefficient, and if you can read it, by mobility ratio. So the volumetric sweep is a function of a lot of things, but it is a function primarily of mobility ratio and heterogeneity. And the incremental oil produced, as this figure says, is a function of only, only two things, the pore volume, the oil saturation change, change between the unswept and swept region, and the volumetric sweep, which I 
choose to be on the basis of something called a, a cobalt factor. Now, at this point, I can basically talk for about an hour about the cobalt theory, but let me just say that we've had a lot of experience in it, and, and we can we think we can make a pretty good first estimate of volumetric sleep with this. Here is that first estimate. This is a, from a 1963 paper by Cobalt that shows the slide that was on the previous slide. It shows the 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 cobalt, the volumetric sweep here as a function of dimensionless time. And here's what a plot of what that equation looks like. You can compare this to that and see that the, the quality would be quite similar. And so <clears throat> Mohammed took that very simple model and he took the data and he fit the, uh, the data that we got from uh, Ryder Scott uh, with that simple model. And you can see on the left hand side is the oil production that shows the dotted lines is the field response and the solid lines is the model response. And one more thing, which I haven't said anything about, and it's important, it also had the CO2 production reported. And once again, the dotted and the solid lines are comparisons between field and, uh, and model. And in both cases, they're pretty good. So simple two parameter match, match, matches the performance. Again, there's substantial variability in performance. Again, CO2 and oil response is very quick. And several large pore volume injection. You can see there are some in here that get up to about four pore volumes in here. And the ultimate recovery is consistent with the data. Now, the reason why that's important is, uh, well, first of all, this is a plot that shows the parameters that was used in the matching. And here's the saturation change. That's pretty small, I think. And here's the cobalt exchanges, which are pretty small too. And I'm still trying to figure out why the saturation changes are so small. And one possibility is <clears throat> there's, a, there's a combination between the viscous fingering and, uh, <clears throat> and the, uh, uh, the saturation left behind. And here's an illustration of that. This is an old picture from the student line where we inject into a five spot with pretty much piston-like displacement. Here's the same circumstances with a uh, an mobility ratio of 100. And you will notice that in addition to the bad sweep because of the unevenness of the front, there's a substantial area in here where there's a mixture. There's mix mixing going on. And another student find has was able to correlate residual oil saturation with the degree of mixing, which is manifest by uh, by the peck on this on this plot right here. So there might be some some things that go with it, but the fact is this is what it took to, uh, to match the data. This range of saturation changes, this range of cobalt factors. The higher the cobalt factor, the more heterogeneous things are. So since we have a model, we can actually plot. This is the oil recovery as a function of injection over here. And we can actually plot the plus or minus two or one standard deviations away from the mean. The mean. And these little gray lines here are the, uh, <clears throat> are the actual field performances. So you can expect substantial variation in performance. Just you should expect when you do CO2 storage to expect substantial variation in performance also. Floods that respond quickly tend to have smaller ultimate recoveries. I'll show that better in the next a later slide. And the majority, majority of the process is again evident. Four poor lives injected in several floods over here. <clears throat> the ultimate recovery is 5 to 15 percent, and there still is a pretty good target even after this is over, but that's probably a discussion for another day. This is a plot about retention efficiency, and, and, and as we segue over to uh, storage, this might be more important in the oil recovery. But here's a schematic that says cum cumulative. The straight line here is injected, and the line below it is the amount of CO2 that's produced, and the difference between the two is retained. This over here is is the amount produced. That's what's shown over here is the lower curve here versus injection. You can see it has the right shape. You can see there's substantial variability, although not quite as much variability as there was in, in, in oil production. And down here is a plot of the retained here as a function of, of injection. 
So yes, we are definitely retaining <clears throat> we are definitely retaining CO2. And if I go to the end over here, that's about four uh, tenths, four, four tenths of the flow volume, which is really about order of magnitude the same as the uh, residual oil saturation in the uh, in, in the reservoirs. <clears throat> Here's a plot that shows the CO2 retained versus the uh, injection rate. Again, it shows a big uh, variability over here. So we can see that CO2 replaces the oil volume, but it also replaces the water volume. And I'm thinking that CO2 mixes with residual oil, but there's a big lesson here for uh, for, for CCS. <clears throat> That's a plot that shows the CO2 retained versus uh, CO2 uh, recovered. And the lesson for CDS here is, are we really storing CO2? And in the upper left-hand corner is a plot, what I would call the utilization ratio. That's the CO2, the MCF of CO2 stored per stock tank barrel of oil uh, recovered. And it's curious to me, there's a lot of variability early on, but down here at the end, it's not so much variability. It is CO2 MCF stored per barrel recovered. Now, if you're uh, kind of a cynic, I guess it's, it's good to be a cynic in some cases, you might say, well, let's just say you're, okay, you are retaining CO2, but honestly, most of that oil is burned and that's generating CO2. And so these calculations down here, and I hope I've done it right, uh, take the, C, the MCF of CO2 stored per incremental barrel of oil produced and convert it over to pounds of CO2 to pounds of oil produced. Uh, these are all conversion factors. And whether it's interesting or whether it's accident or not, or maybe I made an error in calculation. If I did, I'd like to be told that. It turns out to be about an even number, a pound of CO2 stored for a pound of CO2, actually a slide should say a release. Um, the message is you can store CO2. Now, the other message is, I don't think these floods were designed with the idea of storing CO2 in mind, and know that they were optimized for oil recovery. And the chances are excellent that we could actually do a little tweaking to the tweak Tweaking of the uh, tweaking of the design, and actually do a better job of storing CO2 uh, at the same time generating revenue for for EOR. So maturation to mat to migration. So here we go. Maturation. We learn it's a mature technology. It says goes back 50 years old, and if I speak in terms of other types of solvent, maybe even 60 years or 70 years. Most of CO2 is for EORs from natural sources. It's a rapid response. It's funny how, how that would, would used to be considered a bad idea, but now it's kind of a good idea. Most of the oil is produced with the CO2. Formation of oil banks is not necessary. There's no great sensitivity to formation type. I don't think we really sampled enough diversity of formations to maybe throw in this conclusion. But uh, based on what we have so far, it doesn't seem to matter very much. Ultimate recovery is about 11%. About half of the CO2 that's injected is recycled. And, and I forgot to say that on an earlier slide. Uh, when we see a, a, a four core volumes injected, uh, much of that was water injected, whether through a wag process or through water as a chase fluid. So we didn't inject four poor volumes of CO2, but four poor volumes of total, total fluid. Biometric sweep efficiency is poor. There are other solids, ethane, for example, and things like that. And there are other sources, not just naturally occurring CO2. And I believe we'll be migrating in that direction as, as we go forward. So that's maturation. <clears throat> Migration. Many oil field technologies are, transfer, are transferable from CO2 EOR to CCS. In fact, anything that does not have to do with oil is transferable. That's a funny thing to say, isn't it, if you're in the oil recovery business, but that's basically true. 
uh, the wells, the drilling, the operating of the wells, the uh, reservoir characterization part of it, the simulation, all of it is transferable. So the, the hydrocarbon industry is very well, well positioned to, to, to start in this technology. Maybe it won't take 50 years or so for it to be mature with this head start. No detectable cap rock breaches, few surface leaches, uh, at least. That means minimal monitoring of, uh, of the, of it, of the, uh, of the storage sites. There are different time scales. Now, if we're just talking about the injection time and in CCS and the injection time in EOR, they're about the same. They are, uh, uh, they are basically decades, in, uh, you know, 50 years or so, but CCS has a different time scale in the fact that it's going to have to have a, a substantial post injection monitoring period. Uh, and that monitoring period may be several times the size of the injection period. Both of them are subject to a small volumetric sweep because both have large, CO2 has large mobility and uh, there's no reason to think the storage formation will be less heterogeneous than the EOR formations. But the nature of external boundaries is important. And I mentioned this earlier when I talked about semi-steady state flow versus steady state flow. It's conceivable that if we have sealed external boundaries as we do have, think we might have for CCS, uh, that uh, some, of the, uh, some of the deleterious effects of the heterogeneity and, and mobility ratio uh, will not be quite as bad. So the nature of the external boundaries will be important, not so much for CO2 EOR because we have production rates. Simple models can predict, predict uh, CO2 EOR production. I'm pretty sure a simple model would also predict CO2 storage too. The source of the CO2 is different, but the most obvious difference is that is that CO2 EOR produces something that's called an object of commerce. <laughs> Not a bad thing because CO2 EOR could conceivably be used to pay for the storage of in CCS. And in fact, the major issues with CCS are political and economical, not technological. So with that as a conclusion, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Are naturally fractured reservoirs good candidates for CCS or is it better to have a matrix dominated reservoir for storage? Has this been studied? To my knowledge, it, to my knowledge, it has not been studied. Uh, however, uh, <clears throat> of course, always a non-fractured reservoir is better for uh, storage and for displacements. Uh, but I, I'm optimistic about that too, because of the uh, external boundary uh, a part of it there, where uh, the, basically the external boundary will build up pressure, which might prohibit injection, but it also might prohibit fingering and, and all sorts of bypassing. Considering a reservoir with closed boundaries all around, how would inadvertent injectivity problems be mitigated as reservoir pressure increases with injection time? Well, uh, they won't. Uh, that's why you basically won't have to monitor it to, uh, uh, to make sure that you produce, if you do produce at all, an accessible amount of CO2, either through uh, surface dissolution of the CO2 in the aquifer or just continuous monitoring. Uh, estimates of effective storage of CCS, the pore volume of effective storage of CCS are really pretty small, much smaller than static pore volumes. So basically, it's an operational uh, question. Would CO2 injection coupled with brine production make more sense compared with bulk CO2 injection regarding the total CO2 volume? I think it would make an excellent, makes excellent sense. Uh, there are technologies now where you deliberately pr pr produce water to uh, improve the uh, displacement. And when I was alluding to uh, things that we could do with CO2 EOR that would actually maximize storage that was pretty close to the top of the list. So yeah, not, not a bad idea. For relative permeability, does supercritical CO2 behave like gas or fluid? Any special considerations for CO2 relative permeability at supercritical state? Well, the answer to that question is we don't really know. 
But the answer to that question, and understand I'm speaking for myself right now, as you move to larger scales and as you move to more heterogeneous formations, particularly refractors and things like that, the, the importance of relative permeability lessens. And so I would say, uh, uh, say that uh, it's, it's probably not as important as this year as we think it is in oil recovery. I know there has been, uh, my colleagues out at the Bureau have uh, measured uh, CO2 supercritical water, um, water uh, relative permeability, and they don't appear to be, seem to be a lot different. Uh, same thing is true with hydrogen water relative permeability. They don't seem to be a lot different, but uh, much more needs to be measured to know for sure on that. None does. Few surface leak refer to pipelines or equipment on the surface. Yeah, I was uh, I was trying to say that. Now I must I, I must admit that uh, uh, there are there are some suggestions that this that the surface equipment is a lot more leaky, particularly with respect to natural gas, than we'd like for it to be. I was thinking predict, predict particularly of surface equipment involved with production and wells and things like that. But I. Th think I would go out on a limb and say, yeah, I think that would be true also. As you mentioned, the mobility ratio is a controlling factor on sweep efficiency. Can you com comment on the maturity of CO2 form application? That is, that is Pear. Thank you for the question, Pear. That's very good. Well, uh, I haven't studied much. My colleague has, uh, colleagues have studied it and I've uh, come to the conclusion there has been uh, a lot of activity on that in, in the field, and I think there's been success, but it doesn't seem to have been economically viable. So I think that only time will tell on that one. Generally, what do you think about strong CO2 in aquifers? I mean, in comparison to other geologic store, store, storage methods. Well, the problem with aquifers always is, is there's a there's a potential for a leakage. And, and so I would say do it with some, some risk or some aware of the, of the risks involved. Uh, leakage, uh, loss of the CO2 is a cat catastrophe for both the EOR and CCS. And if there's some way we can be a certain with, uh, with not losing CO2, maybe curtain wells or things like that, then uh, I would say go ahead with it, but it definitely is a, a risk factor. You mentioned first CO2 recovery mechanisms as rather drags than displacement. Would you please expand on that? Well, goodness, I would like to say that CO2 EOR is a drag because I'd like to be funny, but uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is that, uh, you know, all the CO2 is oil are produced together. So somehow the, the CO2 is bypassing or fingering to near the front of an oil bank if it would be there and much of the production is because of dragging, not production of uh, pushing. I think it's a little bit like uh, thermal recovery. It's a, it was a recalibration of my thinking about the process. Uh, and that's, uh, I think we're still trying to, to get into more detail on the mechanisms of it. So would CO2 WAG or CO2 foam technologies be applicable to CCS? Yeah, I I think so, but there's something in it, and, and I, I neglected to mention that all of the floods that were in our uh, summary back there were wag floods. Uh, I, I neglected to mention that, uh, maybe I did mention that the sea sealed out of boundary might be a good thing. So that uh, uh, maybe, uh, and there's some evidence of that too, that if you're, if you're pushing up against a partially sealed boundary, it uh, won't, it won't uh, uh, channel as much so that the need of, of WAG would be there. Now, WAG will be there always if you're going to inject CO2 as uh, dissolved in water. But uh, yeah, probably so. Generally, what do you think about the efficiencies of storage heat and aquifers? I mean, in comparison to other geologic storage methods. Well, I can uh, <clears throat> refer you to my colleagues out of the Bureau who studied that uh, question extensively. And they, they seem to think that the <coughs> the biggest immediate target for CO2 storage would be would be uh, aquifers. But in my my view, I the answer would have to be watch this space. <laughs>
I mean, storage in SART cabins has been done successfully in natural gas, uh, gas, uh, gas uh, reservoirs and in aquifers for years. <clears throat> and so I think we'll, the, the answer to that question is I think that's a better option uh, than say uh, rainforests and things like that. But uh, uh, I, I don't know absolutely for sure. How mineral trapping mechanisms can be speed up in CO2 era? Oh, I, I do have some ideas on that because a, a really solid uh, permanent storage of CO2 would be as a carbonate somehow. Uh, but unfortunately, car injecting carbonates doesn't seem like a good idea because that will plug up the well. But it seems possible that one could actually twink uh, to uh, uh, operate with uh, chemical reactions that are non-equilibrium and fix it so that uh, we can actually precipitate carbonates some distance away from the injection well and, and store it in permanently. And carbonates are, are, are more or less permanent uh, permeate storage without uh, too much impairing of the, uh, of the injectors. Other things like horizontal wells might work here or maybe even uh, fractured injection here, but I think there's a future. Uh, most calculations now uh, suggest that it takes too long to store things with, with that. So again, watch this space. Can you elaborate on the economical and political related problems regarding CCS that you mentioned are bigger than technological. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, we've been injecting CO2 in the ground for a long time, and uh, we know how to do it. <clears throat> um, and if we can sort of convince people that we uh, that we know how to do it, then permitting will be easier. And if we can actually figure out how to produce something with the CO2 storage, as is oil. Uh, the economic problems would be partially solved. Now, I, I don't think it'll ever be as profitable as CO2 EOR by itself, uh, but it, it it might actually be a break-even a break-even strategy. So I I am am optimistic about that as well. Has there been any studies showing available injected CO2 pore volumes in the U.S. for CO2 storage, which could help us better understand supply and demand side of these projects, Yusef? I know you have studied that, so you probably know the answer to that question better uh, than, than I have. So uh, I wish to, you know, we were in person so you could answer that question. So uh, I'm sure there there are there uh, there are uh, studies like that uh, it, convincing regulatory bodies that is that is, is work is uh, is is uh, is another matter. Thanks for the presentation. Key message where the maturity of the technology and the applicability of many learnings so far sequestrating aquifers. What do you think are the key R&D areas or uncertainties to be addressed? Well, um, <clears throat> always hard questions, Kareem Abdul. Yes. <clears throat> One of them is basically knowing that you have a bounded reservoir so that the CO2 will stay in, in one place. Uh, other things would be like uh, uh, improving the design of CO2 EOR so it, it does in fact uh, make a little money as you store CO2 and uh, and, and things like that. So uh, I, I feel like those are kind of weak answers, but uh, I think it's going in that direction. Uh, if we inject a depleted HC gas reservoir with strong aquifer with CO2, can we addition, get additional recovery? Uh, wait just a second, that moved away from me. Can we get additional recovery from the transition or wet zone, zone and can it get up to 1% like the average? Yeah, I'm going to go out on the limb on that one too, uh, Ronnie. Uh, there's a pretty big effort uh, now, in, mainly in the Permian Basin, to uh, produce from the so-called ROZ zones. And in my mind, I can't hurt. I'm having trouble thinking about the difference between an R production from an ROZ zone and a production from a thoroughly water flooded reservoir. So I'll go out on the limb on that one and say, yeah, I think we can get 11%, maybe even better. Since Adding CO2 process is also still associated to some extent. Channel is just related to mobility control. Do you think ability control agents, former polymers can optimize the process, including uh, advancing conditions for long-term CO2 storage? Yeah, I think so too. So that's another similarity between the two processes and for largely the same reasons. 
what monitoring technologies can be transferred from EO to EOR to CCS? What advances are needed? Well, that is pretty far out of my level of expertise, but I'm going to give it a shot. If you're going to have to monitor the CO2 uh, storage sites for longer periods of time than the injection is, there's going to have to be some passive monitors, uh, something that doesn't require continual maintenance and continual checking uh, around the place. So I think basically, I don't know in detail what they are, but it will have to be passive monitors rather than active monitors. Could you please comment on CO2 solubility in water and oil for CO2 storage? I think I skipped over a question, but let me do that one since I just read it. Uh, you just reminded me of a point that I wanted to make. Uh, if there is a large oil saturation in the CO2 swept zone, as the uh, indication, the, the, the calculations seem to indicate, then a lot of that uh, swept zone will, will be a, a place where we can store CO2. So yeah, we might still produce enough oil to uh, uh, to make it profitable, but there also the oil left behind could be uh, stored into uh, uh, into uh, that uh, uh, could be a CO2 storage uh, source. So yeah, it it uh, it's not all necessarily bad, and this falls under the definition of uh, of the optimization optimization that I looked for before. Yeah, I'm uh, pleased with all the questions. I'm pleased with uh, everybody's thinking about uh, about these issues. Uh, we are working on it here at UT in a variety of, uh, of places. We're not giving up on CO2 EOR, or in fact, we're not giving up on EOR in general. Uh, but uh, as I look forward, this is actually an expansion of our expertise, uh, not really a contraction in any one, in any one area. So thanks for the questions. And of course, as Joanna just said, I'm happy to uh, uh, happy to answer questions via email. So thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, thank our audience um, and uh, all the wonderful questions and especially <laughs> thank our speaker, uh, Larry Lake. So uh, this was by far our most uh, attended um, webinar and had the most questions. So uh, hopefully uh, many of you will return um, next month. Um, so it's uh, again the second Tuesday of every month at noon or live, but we do publish this uh, webinar and other webinars on our YouTube channel. So if any of your colleagues missed it, then please share it with them. And then finally, I'd like to remind everyone that we have a <coughs> seminar by Dr. Steve Bryant, the Schechter Award winner. And uh, if you're interested in this talk, you'll almost certainly be interested in his talk on, um, on CO2. Um, so uh, please attend that live if you can. And if you can't, we will post a recording on YouTube uh, probably towards the end of next week. So uh, thanks again, Larry, and, and thanks again to all of you.